This panel is, uh, this, in this discussion, we'll take a look ahead to the changing landscape in Canada, but also through North America and South America too. Emerging markets are going to play a huge role, clearly, in the cannabis sector. Um, uh, and will those markets be connected through trade is one of the questions we'll talk about. We'll also talk about the regulatory environment here in the short and long term, and how do you mitigate and or take advantage of that uh, uncertain regulatory environment. It's a privilege to be moderating here. Welcome for those that haven't been part of the cannabis stream to date. You're going to learn a ton uh, from these uh, knowledgeable folks and leaders in the industry. The folks in this panel, uh, Greg Engel, the CEO of Organigram. Organigram is based in Moncton, New Brunswick. Uh, some recent news from Organigram includes provincial supply agreements, um, and actually one that I quite loved, the inclusion of a premium strain uh, in the first ever cannabis sample pack that will be available publicly through a lot cannabis. Uh, focused on the company's focused on producing the highest quality indoor grown cannabis for patients and adult, re adult use recreational consumers in Canada, as well as developing international business partnerships to extend the company's global footprint. Um, in anticipation of the legal adult use recreational cannabis in Canada, uh, the company's developed a portfolio of brands, including the Edison Cannabis Company, which if you spread the shirt, you can see the logo. Or if you're in my kitchen at home, we have a little beaker that's an Edison beaker. So um, full disclosure, I have some of their swag in the house. Um, George Robinson is the CEO of RavenQuest uh, bio, uh, Cannabis Biomed. Um, and I, uh, reading his bio, I, I uh, wrote down he's sort of a cannabis ninja. So um, uh, they have facilities in Markham and in Edmonton. He's a recognized specialist in the cannabis sector and has worked directly um, on all stages of the application and licensing under the ACMPR which is the regulatory body that governs cannabis companies here in Canada. His extensive experience in building, desi building design, municipal bylaws, compliance, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, cannabis cultivation and drying strategies, security, data collection, analysis, and project funding. That's sort of the, makes you a ninja. So Thank you. <laughs> we have a, uh, two people and a ninja on the panel. Um, and Jessica Martin, she's the Vice President of Public Relations and Regulatory Affairs for Invictus. Uh, she is a seasoned communications expert with a broad range of experience in media relations, strategic communications, government relations, and some words that don't even rhyme with that, and digital media. Most recently, she was the press secretary and senior advisor to Ontario's Minister of Finance. She worked with the LCBO to develop the province's cannabis retail strategy, which now we're going to miss. Um, <laughs> but we're, she's going to have great insight into that. Uh, Invictus is a global cannabis company, company offering a selection of products under a wide range of lifestyle brands. They have an integrated approach to, uh, to sales, including uh, medical, adult use, international, um, and others. And also, if you were here yesterday, Gene Simmons. So um, we look forward to sort of wrapping all of that experience into this conversation. We may have some time at the end to take some questions as well from the folks here. Um, and uh, with all that experience, including a ninja, uh, the question comes, who am I and why am I doing this? Uh, I am Jay Rosenthal. I'm the co-founder and president of the business of cannabis. We produce content, research, and experiences that showcase the company's brands, people, and trends driving the global cannabis industry. If you want to follow what the folks in this panel are up to, I recommend you follow Business of Cannabis. And you can find us on businessofcannabis.ca. You can sign up for our newsletter there, but you can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. And the kids are telling me that we're also on Instagram, or Insta, <laughs> or IG, if you, for short. Um, so uh, the, the panel is about the changing uh, legal landscape of cannabis, which is incredibly broad. But, but I want to start a little bit closer to home because it's certainly upon us in just over a month. Uh, Canada will, uh, in the flip of a calendar, uh, have adult use recreational cannabis. Um, but that is not like it was in California where the flip was switched and there's all kinds of products available anywhere in all times, all times of day. Um, talk a little bit about some of the product choice how we're going to be able to buy it um, in different provinces throughout um, Canada, starting here, and we'll go that way. Yeah, so I think we're really going to see two different launches in Canada of the adult recreational program. So the initial launch that's going to happen 30 days from Monday uh, is going to be, you know, a selection of product which is primarily a smokable product or an oral product for ingestion and oils. So. Um, the products that you hear about in the U.S., edibles, vaporizable products, and uh, beverages, those products will not be available until next October. So the way the regulations are in place, um, you know, which is, as Jay outlined, I mean, part of our focus is to really focus on a premium indoor product because, you know, so much of the initial product initially is going to be uh, that 
kind of smokable product, and so whether or not it's um, whole flour or blends or pre-rolls, uh, as well as you know oral oils. And I think what the landscape's going to look like, and, and again, Jessica's got a lot of insight into this as well, is um, you know we're going to see very different launches across Canada. Uh, you know, certainly now here in Ontario, um, there's going to be an online launch, and uh, the retail environment's not going to be up and run running until April. So to give you a kind of a general perspective, and I'll let George and Jessica kind of give their additional perspective, but. Um, you know, basically, Atlantic Canada is going to have retail stores and online available on day one. Um, you know, New Brunswick in particular, but the other Atlantic provinces have been gearing up for this launch and are very well prepared, and they're using Crown Corporation stores. Um, Quebec is following the same model, but they will not have stores available at launch, and it'll be online. And then, um, you know, really kind of Ontario West um, is going to be Crown Corp run, with the exception of Saskatchewan, and private retailers. And uh, BC will have some private and public, but you know, other than Manitoba, and I may be wrong. I don't believe there's going to be any other retail locations open in Canada other than Atlanta, Canada, on day one. So um, it's going to look very different, and it's going to come in stages. So. Yeah, I think the, the you know, Greg's sort of nailed it right on there. And um, can you hear me now? Is that better now? Okay, perfect. Um, you know, the only thing I would add to that is that uh, he, we're going to have a, a lot of interesting stuff. People are just starting to shift, uh, ship product now out to the provinces today. So that's probably the biggest thing. So we'll get a real good sense here in the next couple of weeks of if, if people can fulfill orders and get those orders shipped. So that'll be, I think that's number one in the, in the logistics and supply chain to see if we can get the product out to there. But I think more importantly, there is another regime that kind of gets missed a little bit. Uh, indigenous communities are really starting to step up to the plate right now and coming into the cannabis space. Many of them are taking a look at running retail outlets. And really, they haven't solved the issue of jurisdiction and taxation there either. So other, other than outside of what you see provincially happening, uh, there's a big, big, uh, you know, sort of an unknown in front of us and what the indigenous communities are going to do. And we have a lot of... Um, uh, conversations happening here in Ontario, uh, roughly about th how that's going to happen. So um, that's another regime that we haven't got all figured out. But I don't think anyone ever assumed this was going to be perfect from day one and never assumed this is going to be perfect. Now, there's going to be stops, there's going to be starts, there's going to be hiccups, but the fact of the matter is it'll work itself over time as everything else did. Yeah, thanks. So I'll touch on a little bit more broadly because of my background with government. So. When you look at the prospect for growth in an industry, you have to look at the goals and objectives in terms of bringing that industry forward. So the federal government really only legalized marijuana because they're interested in the revenues, uh, but they're also trying to combat the black market, the illicit market today. And there's a lot of um, product that's not good quality and, and could be potentially dangerous in the illicit market today. So bringing that into government controls is great to improve product quality first and foremost, and then the revenue on top of that. So. Um, but of course, as we've heard today, they're extremely restrictive in the first couple of in the first year. Um, it's just uh, the flour and, and the oils that will be available to customers and edibles, uh, not for another year because they want more time to research edibles. And we've seen reports actually recently this week in Hamilton that um, they're seeing overdoses. So hospitals are seeing overdoses of cannabis. Now they're not fatal when it comes to cannabis, but um, it can be an odd feeling if you really are not used to the experience. And so for us uh, as an industry, we're really focused on education and working with Health Canada to kind of lo lessen the restrictions to allow us to, to engage customers because it's really important that we speak to them at the point of sale or just make education available as much as we can. And so the issue with edibles is that they're just eating too many and then it's too potent. So when it hits them, it takes a few hours, two to three hours to actually set in for you to feel any impact. So I think people need to understand that and so that's why they're taking a more precautious approach in terms of waiting to bring edibles onto the market. And so when you look at various provinces, as, as um, we've alluded to today, um, some are very open to innovation. The East Coast, they're looking at cannabis as a way to, to uh, as a new industry, to really help their economy, which has suffered um, with reduction of fishing in, in those areas over time. And British Columbia has always been really open to innovation in this sphere. And so Ontario, again, a little bit more hesitant. The change in government did um, create some delays in terms of that system. And so we're still waiting to hear what that retail um, network will look like in Ontario. It could be convenience stores, it could be Shoppers Drug Mart, it could be um, private sector stores like us. So we're still waiting for that and of course we'll be eager to get into that market as soon as we hear more details. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I that wanted to ask you guys about because it's really in, in the last panel earlier in the day, we're trying to gauge where this was in the sort of life cycle of the industry. Was this 
was October 17th, sort of 1.0, and then a year from then when more products are available, 2.0. But the consensus was that we're not even in like 0.1. Right. Yeah. Like we're, we're so early. But I guess that, that's the question because uh, a year from October 17th, there'll be many more product forms available, which is really about, it is a regulatory change and something things are preparing for. But talk about how your companies and companies in the space are preparing for that sort of big uh, regulatory shift come a year from October 17th. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll give you our perspective, and I maybe just make one comment on Jessica's um, <coughs> earlier point is that, um, you know, one thing I would reiterate, and I actually testified in front of the Senate as they were reviewing Bill C-45, is that it's physiologically impossible to overdose on cannabis. Um, you would have to smoke 6,000 joints in one day to actually have a toxic effect. So um, just put people's minds at ease. And, and so some of the some of the comments around edibles, and it is the time duration, right? And, and we've learned a lot from jurisdictions like Colorado to limit the dose, right? Each serving should be no more than five or 10 milligrams so that people don't have that experience. Uh, that's not the case in the black market, which is why some of these things are happening. So how we're preparing as a company is, um, you know, we're ready to launch for the current market, but we've been working for months, um, really for years, on the future market. Um, so we have a relationship with a company in Colorado called The Green Solution, which is a vertically integrating leading producer of edibles and vaporizable products. Um, we have proven formulations from them that we'll be bringing to Canada with child resistant package. We, we will manufacture in Canada, but we know how to produce all those products. Um, you know, my production team, we've brought a lot of people in from the food industry as well, and I think Having that experience both from food and from beverage alcohol in our team is critical. And, um, you know, we're also working with the regulators to impact those, uh, the, the legislation as well. So, um, you know, that's critical as well as an industry, but as a company, we're doing that. Awesome. Um, I'd like to just sort of talk about a little bit about policy development when it comes to, you know, both science and innovation. So we, I was lucky enough to sit on a panel a couple of weeks ago where we had Health Canada, the CDSA, most of the provinces there, the RCMP, and really it was exactly to Greg's point. They need to develop policy as quickly as the science and innovation of, of cannabis is going to roll forward, and it's going to come at us like a train. So the real question is, how does that policy continue to get developed? For us, we're going to go very narrowly focused on the products that we choose to bring to market. We're not going to, you know, kind of take the industry with a shotgun approach, more along taking a look at a laser focus of developing products that we believe within our two brands, we just haven't announced them, we have them completely built out, but our two brands that will be narrowly focused on two different sort of um, avatars, or avatars, or people that we think will be great advocates for cannabis, and we'll market them in that approach. So we're, we're, we're gonna go a very narrow focus. We think, uh, in our, our point looking forward, that the, uh, the vape pens will be the early uh, high riser as, a part of, as part of product sales go. If you take a look at California, or even Colorado, we're seeing, you know, 80% increases in those sales over, you know, uh, smokable cannabis products that are out there. So, you know, you'll, you'll, we'll focus on that, and then we'll see what other products come out there. I don't think, uh, you know, trying to solve all of the problems or having, you know, a million SKUs available is going to be good for any one particular company. Maybe there might be one that may wants to do that, but we're going to be extremely narrow, narrowly focused in that area. And I think the other area that we'll develop Within that, you're going to have medical, you'll have your uh, recreational use, but in between that, for many people in the room and like myself, there's a sort of a lifestyle improvement thing, joint pain, you know, in, in, you know, the other areas that this can help out. So I think that you're going to take those two, and then you'll find people uh, like us who may just get a very narrow focus into into these vape pens or into other ways to de uh, to deploy out systems for lifestyle improvement, which I think is going to be a massive market. For us, uh, we're focusing on again, getting our strains, you know, the best quality we can and good strain diversity in our mix because uh, the research we've, we've done shows that people are looking for a variety. They don't typically come back and get the same strain every single time. It's a new market, there's lots, um, you know, available and so they're really curious and they want to taste uh, different varieties and so for us we want uh, kind of a craft cannabis scenario where we're getting premium products but also a variation of products. Uh, again, our consumer research based on legal states, shows that uh, CBD is one of the, the biggest um, drivers of consumer uh, purchases today. And so that's something that we're going to be focusing in when we, um, as we develop our oil extraction program, which allows you to actually tailor the various levels of THC or CBD within your products. And so we know, uh, we don't, none of us really know what consumers are going to be buying um, when it's legal. It's an unknown market because it's just a black market today, and so the research isn't there. So we have to rely on, on the states that we've seen and other countries to see what people like, 
and then adapt our products over time. And so uh, that's our focus. And then maintaining ongoing relationships with government. So we're at the forefront whenever those supply agreements are happening. I think it's one of the more compelling ironies today, literally today, is that this event, which is the, the whole stream around cannabis, is happening in the conference center. And on the other side of the conference center is actually the Canadian Health Food Association. Uh, so it's, and there's lots of cannabis people over there as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, we're talking about today and talking about the market today. And there's probably people from these companies actually over there talking to people about products and, and what's gonna happen tomorrow as well, which is tomorrow in 365 days as well. But it's super compelling. Uh, it does show also that cannabis is really um, part of nearly every component of the Canadian economy right now, or yeah. certainly will be, whether it's medicine or food or beverages or law or media or mm -hmm. Um, anything in between, which is um, why it's fun to talk about it a lot. Um, one of the things that we talked about is in the conversation, uh, sort of in the lead up to the panel, is um, is export and sort of international trade. And there's certainly Canadian companies now that are exporting to other countries, Germany and others. Can you see a time, three, five, ten years from now, when Canada is actually on the import side of that equation in places where it may be quite less expensive to grow, um, and we could lead the world in sort of building products from that imported product. We'll let Jessica, Jessica start. We, we can start this time. Gonna be, we'll let Jessica start this time. Sure. I mean, in order to qualify to go into European markets, you need that extra level of certification. Um, so many companies who are looking at those markets are, are beginning to adapt their facilities uh, right now uh, to meet those requirements. So it's EU GMP certification is, where, is what we're looking in at, of course, to be able to sell to that German market. So that's part of our phase three construction at our farm in Edmonton and that's Acreage Farm. So uh, that's set to be complete in around uh, February or March of 2019. And so we're really excited <coughs> to see that scalability um, and, and the market open up over time. I think, you know, a long road in terms of when we may or may not be importing because we're one of the first countries to, to go through the process of, of uh, legalizing it recreationally. And so I think we're gonna have a lot of knowledge export to offer other countries and research and development and innova innovation. They're gonna be looking to us as a litmus test to see um, what was successful, what wasn't. And so I think we, it's, it's a great opportunity for Canada to be at the forefront on a global scale um, to look at, at how, how it evolves and, and what the market looks like. So importing, you know, yes, there are cheaper places to go, and, uh, but we know there's, there's transportation involved in that. That has regulatory implications. And um, it has a shelf life. And, you know, we've got great locally grown <coughs> products here. And a lot of people are building facilities elsewhere as well. So. I'd love to hear your answer. <laughs> um, I think intellectual property is going to be number one, whether it's imported out in the product or what you're going to build or what you're going to bring back into the, into the country. Intellectual property at the end of the day will be the thing that sort of level sets what's going to happen on an international basis. But more succinctly, will it come in? It's a little bit more difficult. Any organic material or anything other than something that's been fractionally distillated still has to go through CIFA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, to enter into Canada. And that is the people who kind of hold and protect uh, our ability to keep our agricultural side of our business very safe and make sure no other pathogens enter into the country through this material. So the reality of it is going to be it's going to take them a long time before they figure out what's going to be allowable into the country, what form does it come into the country uh, with, and uh, what processes are they going to have in place? Because if they have to receive it, they have to have an equal party on the other side. So the exporting country has to have an equal uh, part of that discussion to say that they approve and ensure, and they have a quality control process in place to make sure that pathogens in that country are not going to come over and enter into the Canadian market. That takes a long time. Greg and I were talking a little earlier today, and people forget that alcohol prohibition repeal happened in 32, but it took 12 years to get it all figured out down in the U.S. So, you know, this is not going to happen. So if it's going to happen in, in five to ten years, Jay, I don't know. But what I would suggest to you, there's a whole bunch of regulatory process when you get down to the agricultural side of a product and entering of uh, plant material coming into the country of any sort. Uh, CIFA really does step up there and uh, wants to have a big part of that discussion. I think you also have to consider that cannabis is a controlled substance, whether or not it's the plant material or it's the derivatives, THC, CBD, um, whatever those derivatives are from cannabis plants or, or from hemp. And so Canada is signatory to multiple UN conventions regarding global drug uh, movement and drug control and, and the INCB or International Narcotics Control Board um, sets limits and discussions. And I've actually um, was fortunate enough to be at one of the meetings um, with uh, one of the agencies on this issue a few years ago in, in, in uh, New York. And 
uh, what I, you know, what I saw and had insight into is that, I mean, certainly there are a number of countries that are very um, resistant. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, they're not going to prevent what you do within your own country, but they're concerned about a global drug trade and what that looks like. Um, we're certainly in a position, we've been exporting product to Australia. Um, we're just finalizing exporting product to Germany currently, and that's for the medical market. So any of the exports you see today are really for medical markets, and everyone allow, has been allowing that um, because there's a medical need. They're not domestically producing there. Other jurisdictions, that's also the case. So, um, But I think when you start to talk about recreational product moving, I think it's going to be much more difficult um, in the near term, potentially in the future. And I think, um, you know, as, as was alluded to, I mean, critically for Canadian companies, it's about IP, it's also about brand creation, um, you know, whether or not your product, and especially for derivative-based products, may be sourced elsewhere. Um, we've taken a bit of a different approach, actually, as a company. Um, we announced a couple days ago we've invested into a Canadian biotech company that's capable of producing cannabinoids from yeast, so taking genetically modified yeast, using proprietary enzymes to convert um, the precursor molecule to THC and CBD, um, and we see that as an infinitely scalable um, process uh, that can displace no matter where you're growing in the world in terms of at a low cost, this could cost, you know, and, and will cost, you know, a penny uh, per dollar versus plant grown derivatives. So uh, it's a big, uh, and, and you can be scaled. So I think, you know, yes, potentially you could grow for less in places like Colombia and Uruguay, um, but are you going to need to in the future? Yeah. Uh, on the previous panel, someone described a company they worked for in the U.S. that that noted Canada in their U.S. business was a rounding error. Um, yeah. <laughs> follow me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the U.S. now, and this is, look, many Canadian industries, once they develop here, like to go big and go into the States. The States right now, um, I don't know what the right word to describe it is, but shit show. Um, <laughs> sounds right. And I'm sorry, my mom is actually watching the streaming, so sorry. Um, uh, and she lives in the States. Um, but the idea that uh, the U.S. is a mess today, it, notwithstanding, it, do you foresee a time when there is trade on the cannabis front between the U.S. and Canada? And I guess that, let's just leave the question there. Do you see a time when that could happen? Um, yeah, no doubt. I mean, it, it, it's going to be timing. There's, there's the treaties that Greg spoke about, but over time, uh, it, it will happen. A lot of us have forgotten. I'm a little bit old enough to remember this, uh, the late 60s and the 70s and the 80s when we actually, as a country, Canada, uh, exported all of our intellectual property around grains and cereals. And we exported that out to North Africa, into places into Europe. We're actually known on the, uh, on the international market as a great agricultural country. And, and with that, we've also done a lot of that work over those years into the U.S. So I just think it's a matter of time when we kind of figure out that THC and CBD is not going to ruin the world, <laughs> like many other people are out there talking about. And once that gets resolved, then I think we will be uh, in a, uh, a place where uh, no different than when Seagram's left Canada and went into the U.S. back in the 50s and the 60s. They had a great platform together of how to make uh, mass scale uh, alcohol. And, uh, and with that, they, uh, they actually went in and dominated. So I think Canadian companies, if, if they prep themselves correctly and do that, that market will open up in time. Whether or not someone just a big, big gorilla who's got a rounding error comes out and buys out one of us, which may occur, uh, it will be an export at some point of our intellectual property back into the U.S. Invictus? Yeah, I agree with the panel here. And I also, and that, that's where our advantage is in starting early in Canada. We get to... Um, keep a lot of that I IP here I in Canada and then export it and that's where the value is long term in any industry So we're really fortunate to again have a government that's accepting of it today and allowing us to To explore all of these different avenues that you're hearing about today uh, w One of the things that is a certainly a Canadian regulatory issue and one that uh, is, Causes much consternation in the industry now is that the marketing and branding components of what's about to happen after October 17th is like super strict it's strict, more strict than tobacco is right now. So we're starting in a place of this highly restricted marketing and branding environment, and maybe over time that becomes less and less, hopefully. H how do you actually go about dealing with that from a corporate level, um, thinking about entering a marketplace where nobody has bought anybody's products, entering a market where all these products are available to people, but really no brand identification yet? Yeah, I, you know, I think, so... 
when we think of branding and you know i think why a lot of people look at the kind of branding restrictions because the package in and of itself is going to be very restricted as a starting point but the package is only an element of your brand right and i think you know what's critical and again um, depending on where you are in the country so you know our focus is with both the private and the public retailers the crown corps spending heavily on training making sure that um, when there is an in-store location available that those staff are educated, they understand your brands, they understand your product, they understand the brand positioning or differentiation. The same way today here in Ontario, um, if you went into an LCBO and you talk to a vintage's staff in the wine area, they have a very high knowledge of kind of different wines. And you know that's our approach and the retailers are taking that approach. Um, but it's also about creating an awareness and developing your brand and, and you know, we've done extensive market research, um, not only in Canada, but are fortunate with our partnership with the Green Solution in Colorado to leverage that and do market research with existing cannabis users there. So we understand brand segmentation and we've created brands to hit different demographics and targets. And, um, you're, you know, part of your messaging is really around everything you, you know, everything you do is about brand creation. And whether or not that's through own media, that's through secondary media, um, there's going to be a lot of media coverage on the space and you know companies that rise to the top in terms of their brands and their differentiation stories and that's why we made a decision as a company where many companies have gone to greenhouse grown product in Canada um, we are 100% indoor producing premium products and you know you have to have a differentiated product I mean Jessica alluded to it with different strains George spoke about it with you know, IP and talks, you know, so so if, if you're just a Me Too company producing a Me Too product, it's going to be very difficult to create a brand. Um, I, I, you know, uh, branding is going to be, and, and marketing is going to be tough. There's no doubt. But we, again, I'm going to, I always like looking a little, I have a little rear view mirror that sits up here. It's like a proverbial one. Uh, alcohol, this is exactly how alcohol came out in Canada. You have to go behind a counter with people with white jackets, you went up there, and that's what the term brown bagger comes from because you were given alcohol in a brown bag. So you have to remember that the agencies that are running this, which are, you know, everyone is now the alcohol commissions, that's, the, that's what they know, right? So th this is the process that we're going to go down. This is no different than the, the approach to alcohol. But you have to see where alcohol is today. You know, we have, there's, Everyone's sponsoring everything in alcohol, and right now in cannabis, we can't even talk about it, right? We go out in the streets, we almost get uh, thrown in jail if we talk about it. It's going to take some time, but it's going to be there. But I think more importantly to answer how you solve the marketing issue, realistically, that's going to get solved by making sure that you have uh, a consumer brand that people want to talk about it for you and influence for you via social media. I think number two, uh, it's going to have to be come down to what we've, we've done is, you know, when younger people or whatever, Every time you have a backyard party or you have a kitchen party, that's where cannabis is really going to come to the forefront and really people share their experiences that they're having with cannabis. So this is where it's going to start from. So you really have to take your company approaches. How do you get into the people's backyards? How do you get to around the kitchen table? And how do you get your brand really known? And that's where I think the momentum will come with that brand. And that's going to come down to what both Greg and, and Jessica have said. You know, if you want to eat good food, you have to have good ingredients. If you want good wine, you have to have a good grape. And for us, all three of us up here, luckily, uh, we all are focusing on having an extremely good product that starts in the basis of that good food or that good wine, and that's the exact same approach that we're taking here. If it's repeatable experience, it's a predictable experience. Every time you take it, it gets around the kitchen table or the backyards, guess what? You'll have a great product, no matter if it's restricted on the branding side or not. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think, um, you know, what it comes down to when you're talking about branding is trust. It's trust between you and that organization. And it's it's a new product. And a lot of people haven't tried it, or it's the first time in a long time that they've tried it. And so the product is a lot different than it was 40 years ago. <laughs> and the experience is going to be a lot different, in too. And so um, we're really, you know, our, our goal, we have a few brands that we've just launched the names of, and we'll have more as we build momentum into October 17th. But our medical brand is Vitaly. Uh, that's going to focus education and patient acquisition and everything related to the medical side. And our recreational side has four brands. And uh, we'll have the different strains that I'm talking about fall under these brands. And so the goal, the idea behind the brands is to actually give you an idea, give the consumer an idea of what experience they'll get out of it. So we have Dukes, which is kind of everyday, moderate THC levels. We have Zoe, which is our line targeting women. And it uh, tends to be uh, lower THC levels and higher in CBD. And then we have Sterling and Hunt, more refined, all our specialty lines, kind of limited availability product will come out there. 
and then sinister is for a higher THC. And so when we uh, release a new strain and it's under one of these brands, then you'll kind of know as a consumer what might you know be suitable for for your needs. And so um, that's how we're talking about it. When it comes to as everyone else has talked to today as well, um, it's earned media where we're really going to get our brand names out there. Um, yes, all the media are talking about it, and you know whether or not governments fulfill their commitments as regulations change. So much opportunity. And it's what everyone is talking about on the streets and in the news. And so for us, um, that's my background in broadcasting, 15 years uh, from behind the scenes and in front of the camera. That's why I was brought onto the team partly uh, to help bring that network in of earned media. And um, that would be critical. Yeah. And wh one of the things that um, is about <coughs> to be a bigger issue here in Ontario, so maybe Jessica, it might be compelling to talk about is um, it, it's only going to be online sales initially in Ontario starting October 17th at 12.01, whatever time that is. Um, uh, there's a big hope that their website doesn't crash. At least I think that's probably true. How people find products on that will be, will be compelling. But I think the more interesting part of what's going to happen in Ontario is actually going to be in the spring. And that relates to brick and mortar retail shops, some number of them opening up all private. And I guess it actually comes down to regulatory. We, we start with the federal, where it's federally legal on the medical side, federally legal on the recreational side. But where the rubber meets the road, and it certainly has in California and Colorado and other places, where municipalities actually have a lot more say than they have here, what do you think municipalities will have to say about the retail environment in Ontario for sure, and in other places too, but Ontario specifically? It was really fascinating working with municipalities as we developed this legislation to see what the appetite was. Um, elections are a huge problem. I think there's a lot ah. of nimbyism <laughs> in terms of progress, in terms of many things. But nimbyism, so not in my backyard. If a councillor was up for an election, there's a municipal election coming up, they don't really want a store in their backyard because their, their constituents are going to potentially complain or ask questions about that or why we, were we the first ones, why are we the guinea pigs. And so you do get a lot of resistance. And then there are others, like Niagara Falls, who know it's a tourist attraction and know it's going to be great for their economy. And so they're very willing to have as many stores as they can. And so uh, the province currently will give municipalities the option to opt out. And so if you're looking, if you hold a lease in a certain municipality, you might not even be able to have a store there. And so it's difficult for us when you've got to have the stores open, you know, as we've heard in April, and that there's construction, there's, again, getting product to the stores and all of that. And for me, the concern here is education at the point of sale. The point is you're interacting. That's why bricks and mortar are so fundamental and critical for this industry. Online, you're, you're relying on the consumer to do their research, whereas at the point of sale, you can be sure to tell them you know, maybe wait a few hours, all of those things that we're talking about today. And so um, that will evolve, and it's necessary, I think, in this market. And actually, Greg, thank you. Uh, Greg, because we were just talking uh, when we were out in New Brunswick for the World Cannabis Congress, we visited the cannabis uh, NB store. And it is set up exactly as you're talking about, education first, and it's run by the province. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, that province's approach to retail, to cannabis retail? Yeah, I mean, we're fortunate to be based in New Brunswick that um, they have seen from day one and they've embraced the industry. So um, they look at it as job creation. Um, and, you know, not only were there, we're a large employer. We have over 400 employees today, and we are currently using another 180 contractors for the next 18 months. Um, so almost 600 people um, are being employed. But then there's the indirect employment as well, where the largest test lab in Canada, RPC, is actually supported through the government as well. And they do testing, my understanding is, for around 60, 70 percent of the industry. So um, the province really embraced the idea, saw cannabis as uh, a way to create jobs, um, knew that there was already an existing black market and wanted to displace that black market as quickly with po as possible with a tested product. And uh, it just continues to foster the fact that the First World Cannabis Congress was actually in St. John, New Brunswick, uh, is a testament to that. And so as they've prepared for their retail stores, we've been working with them for two years. Um, you know, this is not, uh, the stores were all up and ready to go for July. So they actually, if the program would have launched in July, which is kind of the early indications had looked at that, um, they would have been able to go. So all 20 retail locations uh, in New Brunswick will be open on October 17th because they're ready to go. They've been training staff. We've been working to train their staff. So 
Um, it, you know, again, it's fortunate. And, and the rest of Atlantic Canada has really followed it to some degree as well because, you know, the example earlier about, you know, Prince Edward Island, for example, see, they're, they're very disappointed that it doesn't launch until October because they saw a huge opportunity from a tourism perspective um, and they've missed that tourism window this year. So, um, George, can I ask you one question? Because it's not just about the retail part that has the municipal implications. It's also, you know, everybody's growing inside now in Canada, mm -hmm. whether it's a million square foot greenhouse or large warehouses or, or buildings. W what has been your experience working with municipal government on making them okay with large scale grows inside? Because early on they weren't too keen on it, and now they realize there's, you know, 100 jobs here that are never going away. What's been the result? Yeah, well, it's really been quite interesting because it's very different province to province. Uh, let's start off in BC, you know, where it's kind of our, our consulting team works out of. Uh, it's very interesting where the ALR was allowed free range to have cannabis production in it. And then just recently, a couple of months ago, well, actually a little less than that, we had the current government change that to say now, uh, even though it's an ALR, the municipality and the municipal or regional district has the choice of choosing of not whether they'll have cannabis production in those communities or not. And it's turned a lot of people's heads like right around. So on Vancouver Island, almost uh, it's going to be very hard going forward to put up a cannabis production facility because those communities just don't want it there. They want their ALR saved for uh, other types of agricultural products. But then you go into Alberta, you go into Saskatchewan, you go into Manitoba. This is an employment opportunity they're not going to miss and they want to be a part of it. We have communities reaching out to us say, please come and start something here. Let's reinvigorate the economy within, it, within our municipality. Uh, and then like you said, you're gonna have other areas where people are just got a stigma to this that they're, they just don't know how to make the choices. Our approaches go in, we educate. We don't sell, we educate, we educate municipalities. We're very lucky we have a great relationship with uh, several provinces on a under contracted basis, uh, working with them. Uh, so what we have is the ability to go out and educate them and take down this fact. We have to first start off by saying cannabis is being consumed today in your community, every day in your community. Two, uh, th this is just something that you have an opportunity with to actually control it. It's coming at you. This is what we say. Cannabis is coming at you. Why not control your destiny, municipalities? If you don't, it's coming at you anyhow. So this is one of the big themes that we take to them and say, uh, you have to make a good choice, you have to make a logical choice, it has to be great for your constituents, but it's coming at you and you can't stop it. What? Yeah, I've, uh, <laughs> I just have a funny anecdote about that. I did an interview while I worked for the government uh, with, with Canadian press and they, they said, well, can municipalities opt out? And I said, and it was when we we're just tried identifying the first municipalities and we said, I said, well, not really, I mean, because there's online delivery. And so whether or not you have a physical store, people in your community will be consuming cannabis. And so the, the headline, municipalities can't opt out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to create a big story about it. And my point was, you know, just you can't deny the fact that it's here and it's going to be legal. And um, people are apprehensive about it and that's understandable, right? It's, it's something new and unknown. And so, yeah, our goal here is to educate and it's not a scary thing. And as long as it's consumed responsibly, like anything else, it's recreational. Um, you know, and, and then, but aside from that, there's so many benefits from the medical side that we're so excited to just see evolve over the next couple of years. It's just so, in sorry. Sorry, I was just going to add one point yeah. to Jessica's last point on education. I think what's one of the key things, we haven't talked about it today, but I think it's one of the things, we, we did a survey um, that results were published a couple weeks ago with Enveronics, surveying parents across Canada. And what's really interesting is, you know, there was still just over a third of parents had spoken to their children to date about cannabis and kind of what's going to happen with regulations. Um, but 90 over, just under 90% were planning to before the regulation and, the, and launch the program because it is in the media every day. But I think what was interesting is, um, you know, they're looking for resources. So as a company, we've posted resources at our website. And, but working with the key provinces and especially, again, in Atlantic Canada, um, they've put a ton of resources into how to educate children, you know, parents to talk to their kids and be able to talk to their kids about this is coming. It's not that it doesn't exist today, but there is a different perspective. And I think that's one of the huge benefits of a legalization of an adult recreational program is there's going to be educational initiatives and programs. Um, you know, the message within Health Canada has switched from, you know, not don't do this, understand the risks associated with, and it's a big change, right? So. Um, because it is out there and Canada has one of the highest adolescent uses in the world and, and we can't deny that. I think it's important that we that we educate and that parents are in a position to educate their their children about the risks of 
you know, chronic use as a, as a teenager, et cetera. And so that's a big part of what we're supporting as a company and what the industry is supporting. So it's interesting because there certainly it's driving conversations between parents and their kids and with lots of resources. But and we're having an event in October that's a lot about people our age talking to our parents right. about it <laughs> because increasingly, as Jessica said, there's many, many sort of seniors, however you define that, looking to cannabis to take some level of their 14 medications off the table. Right. And that conversation, both on the medical side for sure and on the recreational side, are really important things to have because as Jessica was saying, if you consume cannabis 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, this is not that cannabis. This is, not. This is quite, in many cases, much more potent and much more pure and, and, and better mm -hmm. uh, by any definition of that. But it is something to, to be knowledgeable. Uh, w one last question and then maybe we'll have time for others. Um, what do you think, looking ahead in the next year, what are the sleeper stories, whether it's related to regulatory or not, that we, that we should be paying attention to but maybe aren't? I'll start with Jessica. Sure. I mean, so again, based on Colorado, I was asking about what we can expect right in October. And, and again, it comes back down to education. And um, a lot of people, it'll be a new feeling. And so, you know, when you talk to your friends about maybe they, they tried it once and it wasn't a good experience for them and they felt like they were dying and they called 911. And so I said, is this, can we expect an increase in volume calls to 911? And they said, yes, that's exactly what happened in Colorado because mm -hmm. they didn't know where else to go. And so from a government perspective, just from a societal perspective, you don't want those lines tied up. Um, and so some governments are bringing forward uh, different phone numbers, places you can call. Again, um, we're offering services. I think. Um, licensed producers in terms of a call center to kind of ask about what you can expect in terms of some of the symptoms. So, um, so yeah, it, it'll come down to that, and it'll be uh, talkmedown.com. Just right, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> George. Yeah, I think the sleeper story for for me, at least anyhow, and and for us, I think um, in, in five years, maybe a little bit more, cannabis is going to be the first thing you go to for wellness. This can be the first thing you're going to go through for medicinal reasons, not where it is today, which is always at the end of the bus, right? You have to try everything else and then you get to go to, to cannabis. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Not only is the plant extremely interesting and a lot of fun what, when you start understanding what's in there, but more importantly, the dosage cost of cannabis is way less than the current cost of a benzoid or, or benzo or an opioid. So what you're going to look at is you're going to get a heavy push from uh, the insurance companies that are going to start taking a look at this and say, hey, listen, let's bump this up to the start of the remedy or, 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 or the symptom relief that we're going to be looking through rather than leaving it at the end. And that's going to sweep the world as I see it. So I think that's the real sleeper is that you're going to go to cannabis first versus last. I think one of the things we consider when we look at how the Canadian program is going to launch is this is a social experiment but that at the end of the day, the world is watching. Mm -hmm. If you really think of it from that perspective, right, um, I know in discussions with the federal government, they're in constant dialogue with other jurisdictions who want to understand how we're doing this, how it's worked, not only historically in the medical program since it launched, but as we prep for the adult recreational program. And I think that's one of the things that's going to be, when I, you know, your question, Jay, a, a bit of a sleeper is that um, we're already seeing movement globally happening in terms of medical markets starting to move and markets that we didn't expect to have discussions around you know cannabis as a medicine like singapore um, that you know no one would have predicted they're starting to look at potentially putting a program in place whether or not that happens or not we don't know yet but there's a, a global tide happening here and certainly canada's uniquely positioned to really drive that. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, it's not only going to be what happens here, it's the impact we have on the globe, which is pretty interesting. It's pretty rare that Canada can have this global impact on, on, a, on an industry, on a health and wellness product, uh, and really be driving it. And I think that's a real exciting part of what we're doing. Amen to that. So I think we're actually out of time. We went a little bit over, I apologize, but it was fun to hear you guys talk and learn more. Um, and I know some of us will be sticking around in and about the conference. So, so thank you so much for listening in today. Those that are listening and streaming, including my mom. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. This is going to be an amazing year. Look forward to seeing everybody next year as well. Thanks so much. Thank you.